many, many moons ago, when I graced the New York Times and I was the blog liaison, or I was liaison for the software developers, which means they'd say something and then I'd go to an editor and go, what they really mean is, and that was considered like, wow, crazy. And then when I did, worked with blogs, people were like, you're working with blogs? WordPress? So fast forward only, ooh, seven, eight years, and now we have a deputy off-platform editor and a global growth editor after being director of global adaptation at BuzzFeed? Millie, come up here and explain to us what you're doing. <laughs> remarks because I wanted to okay great okay so I have prepared remarks because I wanted to take you through all, my entire brain um, and I'm they're on my phone so I'll see your tweets so only tweet nice things to me please <laughs> Um, as Kathleen said, what does off-platform even mean? Um, and as I was thinking about this presentation, I knew I had to start with explaining what my job is, which luckily or not, um, I'm used to. My last two roles were a director of global adaptation at BuzzFeed and global growth editor at the New York Times, both of which were the first time either of those organizations had those roles. Um, and then a few months ago, I started uh, a new role that we are trying to figure out, Deputy Off-Platform Editor. So I always know it's a good move when I have to explain my job title. So I'll start there. So the easiest way to tell you what off-platform is is to tell you what it's not. So for that, at the Times, we call on-platform. Um, on-platform at the Times is our homepage, it's our app, newsletters, and push alerts. I actually listened to Meredith Artley's keynotes as well as several others to prepare, and she showed um, this amazing chart with like a red core and like gray bubbles around it representing all the other platforms and there are definitely parallels there, right? I actually can I'm mobile yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot <laughs> Maybe my phone is mobile. Okay, so I listened to Meredith Arthur's keynote. She had this amazing chart There are definitely parallels in how she, you know CNN thinks about their core and then off-platform um, on platform is that red core for us. It's what we control, it's our destination, it's our brand, and it's our house, and you need to get your house in order first. Luckily, we have an amazing team that does all of this work. Um, but the pendulum swings. I remember writing a Neiman Lab prediction for 2018 about how news organizations need to focus on their brand, and that is the core of what you do. That's your platform, that's what you own and control. So. The one I wrote for 2019, um, however, was about how there's no magic, only work, which I'll explain more later. But for now, think about how often you hear about how home pages are back after being dead and back after being dead. Um, innovation doesn't have to be big and flashy, right? Um, it's a continuing process of gradual improvement. Things change, but slower than you think, and mostly cyclically. So this is an incomplete list of what I work on and what my team works on. So what does that look like day to day? And why is off-platform so important? Um, here, actually, I'll go back to this. So off-platform is so important is because our editorial approach and our news judgment is slightly different on an off-platform, right? So, which I'll illustrate in a bit once I talk you through what a typical day looks like. But success off-platform requires you to be educated and understand how you reach and communicate with different communities, right? You can't just parachute in on any given topic um, you need to prove that you've done the work and understand those communities. You need to be native to the platforms. You need to be able to speak the language of those communities, whether literally or not. Um, I had a lot of uh, experience there when I was at BuzzFeed working on global adaptation as well. And then just as an aside, um, my former boss at the American Press Institute, Tom, who you heard from earlier, um, he's thought about being platform orthodox versus platform agnostic. For like, I looked it up, it was in... 2009, so it was like a decade ago. It was prescient then and still relevant now, so you should Google that. Um, 
So the value I hope to bring in this role is two things, right? It's to deeply understand the news value of the New York Times and to also deeply understand all these communities off platform um, and the opportunities we have to reach those communities. Um, so I'm constantly translating, connecting, making decisions big and small every single day. And so it's, we're still translating things and connecting things. So what that looks like every day, um, it looks different every day to be honest, but I'll show you one example to illustrate that um, and the types of decisions that me and my boss, Cynthia Collins, who I believe is one of the smartest people at the New York Times. Uh, okay, I've lost my slides. Um, who I believe is one of the smartest people at the Times that we make every day. So after the State of the Union address in February, um, you might remember this photo of Nancy Pelosi clapping at President Trump. It's easily like the photo of the night. Um, people were sharing it. It quickly became meme, like reached meme status. Everyone was memeing it. Um, it wasn't on our homepage and it wasn't on our front, print front page the next day. But the photo is our top Instagram post of I think in the past two years. This was a social story and the Times can and should be in on that conversation in a way that's comfortable with the ethics of the New York Times. And we actually did write about it and that story did well. However, uh, one of the joys of being at the Times is that it just so happens that Doug Mills, our photographer, uh, took this photo and he's one of the best in the world. So we were able to supplement that story that we put up quickly that night with a little backstory about how he took it, kind of what his thoughts were. So what, it wasn't just about Nancy Pelosi and clapping, right? It was that moment, but it was about the photography and how we did that work, um, which is why it's, it's so important to understand off-platform and to be able to kind of juggle these two modes. Um, and also the reason why it's important off-platform is that people might not tr already trust you in the same way they would if they would go to the New York Times homepage. So, why am I telling you all this? Who am I? I'm, um, there are really only three important things you need to know. Not important, but relevant things you need to know about me in the context of this presentation. Um, the first is that I'm obsessed with how people get and share their news. But really what that means is, I think, deep empathy and conviction. I believe strongly that news organizations are the foundation of a strong democracy. I also believe in sh sharing news and information as a way to connect with other humans and uh, your friends and family and communities. Um, and it was really my time at the American Press Institute that kind of cemented this uh, obsession. We did countless reader surveys about how people get their news and how news organizations were changing and adapting to kind of the digital climate. Um, the second is that I like to peer around the corner and anticipate how things are going and how things are changing. So I did a lot of that at BuzzFeed when we launched the BuzzFeed News app. Um, and then in building the global adaptation and translation team to really understand how news and information travels globally and on social and mobile, all that. And finally, I'm a systems thinker. Um, and what I mean by that is like, like not only to understand individual parts, but kind of how all those parts work together um, and other forces that influence that. So I think a lot about networks and how multiple systems work together. and. What better place to do that right now than the times where I'm learning this big organization and trying to understand how those pieces fit, not in just the context of the New York Times, but also kind of the media, media ecosystem at large and just kind of a, the moment we are right now in news and media. Um, so all this experience I just shared, um, I think about them as like layers and inputs to kind of what we're doing now and where we are now. Um, we're in a pivotal point with social media and platforms right now. Um, we're in a moment of great debate over here in the US and around the world over platforms. And what we've seen is that a lack of oversight comes with great consequence. Um, so while this critical work is happening at the times um, on our business side and throughout the organization, um, in my role specifically in the newsroom, I have to be a responsible steward of the risk and value um, and the limitations of each platform while also continuing to emphasize all the great value in journalism that comes from these platforms. And it's how we reach and learn about our readers. So I think it's really easy to sit on one side or the other and demand regulation, which you know we should do in different ways. Um, but from where I sit, I'm negotiating the value in those risks every day 
decisions big and small. So all those decisions can be consequential for good or bad. Um, here's one example uh, of the Midwest floods. So this was a great story on the ground coverage. We sent a reporter and a photographer. Nebraska was our top state for readership, um, we, and along with other states in the Midwest, we don't usually see that. And the reason that the story reached Nebraskans, because that's not our usual readership, is through these niche communities, um, we saw uh, shares from farmers and local groups and others. And you know, Nebraska is not our top state for readership, so through social, we were able to kind of light this fire and, uh, sorry for the nature metaphor, uh, <laughs> light, this, light this thing and then have it spread um, through these niche communities. So, you know, this example is a lot about distribution. The next example is about coverage. So, Nipsey Hussle's death, his funeral was yesterday in L.A. It was a big deal. We, the New York Times actually has more readers and subscribers in California than New York, um, which people are surprised by. Um, so Nipsey was a rapper based in L.A. who's known both for his music and kind of philanthropic ventures around the community in L.A. And it was a big deal that he like grew up and still lived in that community. Um, this is our coverage from yesterday and since his death. My question is, would Nipsey be as covered, would be as covered a story as it is for the New York Times 10 years ago, if not for all the signals we got from search and social? What we saw was this was one of the most searched and most interacted with story of 2019 so far. And I think, you know, if you don't use those signals, you'll, you'll never see those blind spots. So we saw all these signals from search and social showing demand for more on him, his work, his community, and the outpouring of grief after his death. Um, there's a group of four of us in the newsroom who deliver this audience update at our 9.30 news meeting. It's and that's such a great way to kind of pull in all the signals and have it not just influence distribution, but also your news judgment and news value of certain topics that your audiences may demand, um, which is replicable to newsrooms of any size. Um, so those are some of the benefits that we would have not otherwise have had without social and off platforms. So where are we and what's different now? So tabloids have always existed. Misinformation has always existed in one form or another. The U.S. used to spread propaganda through the radio. That you, you used to have to dial into that. It took a long time to spread messages. Um, people have always shared news and information. It used to be through word of mouth, and then maybe you'd like write a letter, and maybe you email, and then it was social, right? So what's new now is that the feedback, you, you'll, you'll notice I love frameworks too. So, um, sorry, I lost my spot. This is the, this is the danger of having things on your phone. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling. Okay, so, so tabloids have also always existed. And what's new now is that these feedback loops are tighter and faster, right? The scale's unprecedented. And this is something I'm so grateful to have learned and really deeply understand at BuzzFeed. The internet opens this immense scale. So it's social combined with the rise of mobile, which by virtue of being a device we put in our uh, pockets, or which may as well be connected to, to my arm at this point, um, has exasperated both the misinformation and disinformation and the kind of social sharing that we used to all do to connect. So that's where we are now. So you can not only reach more people faster, you can reach them in a more personal way than ever. So what makes this really difficult now is that the usual signals we rely on for legitimacy are increasingly garbage. That's the problem, right? That's, that's what the rise of inf misinformation is all about. So it used to be that if you had a photo on bio on your Twitter account, for example, like, and maybe a website or a portfolio, you might be a real person online. Um, I just think about that New Yorker cartoon of like a dog being like, hi, I'm a person online. Um, we obviously learned in 2016 that isn't true. AI generated photos, doctor videos, you name it. There's it used to be about gathering a lot of signals and weighing them against each other to say, like, is this real or not? Um, but what do you do when most of those signals are bad? Um, so you understand what cheap signals are, understand that things that are easy to counterfeit, followers can be bought. We had a great piece about that. Um, blue check marks only go so far. So you have to look for solid signals that are hard to replicate. Faking a long history on Twitter is harder to replicate than making an account with a lot of interactions. Um, faking extensive reporting on a topic is hard, much harder to fake. 
So it's easy to fake realness now, um, so we just have to be more careful than ever, and that's why it's so important to have that news judgment combined with platform-specific knowledge. So that's where we are now. Um, digital media literacy, and I guess in a room of academics, that's really important. Uh, the signs we rely on in the physical world to know what's real are absent online, and I just explained, easily manipulated and counterfeited. So how do we help our audiences around the web to understand what we're doing and to build and rebuild that trust? So I, I think you can kind of see this. So one way we've done this, right, I talked about distri distribution and um, just the news value of certain stories. This is about that transparency that was talked about earlier in today's panel. Um, it's about showing your work, saying you talked to two dozen former staff members, saying you reviewed 100,000 documents, saying you looked at drone footage and interviewed people on the scene, and inter I was gonna say interview the rubble, he can't, but like, you know, interrogate the rubble on the ground. Um, so, you know, these are just small ways we can do this every day. You'll see it on the daily and the weekly. Uh, we constantly have reporters going on the daily podcast talking about their work, how they do their work. Um, and you'll see it on the weekly, which is our TV show premiering in June, which I think, you know, there's something about television and visuals that is really um, visceral. So showing the work, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that yet. So showing the work we do is so important now because all these attacks against the press around the world, and this is replicable, right? This is just saying how you got the information, how you know what you know. Um, news literacy is arguably more important than ever, and it's important for all of us to prioritize platforms in which people still get their news and information. If we're not there, that's pretty dire. Um, so let me end here. So um, multiple things can be true at once, and however many people are leaving social media for privacy concerns, for hyperpolarization, or just fatigue, we're spending more time on our phones than ever. Um, I, I'd ask you to look, but I think we're low on time. But you should look at your screen time, either on uh, your iPhone or Android, and I bet you it's like quite similar to this. The average American is spending upwards of like I think six hours with digital media. Um, so that's you know we're 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 increasingly more connected, whether or not we're on certain platforms or not. Um, so. What do we do now? Um, that, plus the fact that so much happens online, so much potential news happens online, means we have to better understand and react and adapt to as news organizations. So it's about social publishing, it's about distribution, but it's also about understanding this new system in which we're operating in and being much smarter and more rigorous about our approach to it. So no one knows what the right way is yet, and if they tell you they do, they're lying. Um, so here's my hypothesis for the foundation I think we need to build to be able to start figuring this all out. It's a deep understanding of these three things. It's news and media, how does information travel around the internet and around the world? It's psychology and human behavior, how does our psychology affect how we consume and share the news and information? The most useful thing I can tell you is that you should read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's all about our hidden biases and how we make decisions and has, it, it's life changing. Um, and then technologies and platforms, right? Do we understand the technology and algorithms behind what's shown to us? Do you know how and why you see certain things on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram? Do you know how Google surfaces search results? And I ask those questions both from a consumer perspective but also as a journalist. <coughs> Sorry, but also as I'm, I like move my hands, um, but also as a journalist and also for us working in news or organizations or academics um, teaching the next generation of young minds. So I, that's, that's my best guess as what we need to kind of build upon to start figuring all this out, um, but no one knows what's going to happen next. Thank you. So, Lily, about three dissertation proposals in a year are going to start with, you know, as Millie Tran said at the 2019 ISOJ conference, there are three, trust me, I've been there, we're all looking for that intro. So that was really fascinating, thank you so much. So one thing I want you to clarify, 
how does the Times really do, uh, make a distinction between social media and off-platform? With, I guess, off-platform being the bigger universe. Yeah, so I, I would say social media is all the kind of big platforms we think about, right? It's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, off-platform, we think about more broadly. It's, it can be Apple News. It can be Google Search. Um, it's basically anywhere someone may encounter the New York Times that is not the owned and operated platforms. Um, also, I, I should say, social as we know it, we usually think about kind of big public platforms. I think the next, I mean, I don't, this is happening right now, but there's a lot, there's going to be a lot less, I think, one-to-many sharing and much more one-to-few, one-to-one sharing. So mm -hmm. you're seeing that kind of um, more niche sharing happen, um, which poses diff a different set of challenges. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, and you're talking about challenges, and one of the challenges is just being at the New York Times, right? I mean, you touched on that a little bit. There's an extra bit of pressure to get things right, isn't there? Yeah, I, I'm, I've been uh, hiring for our team, and someone asked me what was like the most annoying thing about being at the Times, and it, it, the most annoying and hardest thing is that there's no, there's very little room for error, right? There's no margin for error. You get something wrong, like 20 people will write about it. You delete a tweet, 20 news organizations will write about it. And I think that pressure is, um, some people like it, others don't. Um, but it's just something we have to live with and it just kind of forces you to anticipate and try your best and hopefully have it be your best because it sucks. Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> when it's not. Yeah. But um, I know when I was there a long time ago, another problem was that the Times was like the Queen Mary. It did not move that rapidly or elegantly. <laughs> are, are, are some of those challenges still out there, even though it's a leaner newsroom? So I've been at the Times for about two years now, and I should say I've been, it, it, even within my two years, I feel like so much has changed about how we function as a newsroom. It's really quite incredible. I, you know, I don't, I've never worked at a newspaper or legacy organization before, and it's really easy to start things. It's, it's easy to build things when there's, there's nothing you have to address, right? And I think the challenge with the Times and a lot, a lot of legacy news organizations is that you like take two steps and then take one step back. And it's that constant negotiation. And it's, it's culture change, right? And what I learned about culture change, which is a new challenge for me, is it's just the grind of day-to-day -day work. You, you just have to put in the work and you have to, have, you have to take the long view. Otherwise, it can, it can get frustrating, right? Because you think, I'm doing this thing, why isn't why am I not seeing X, Y, Z? So, it's the long game. You just dropped something a minute or two ago, like, you know, when I'm hiring people or I'm in the process of hiring. Please apply and really? join my team. Tell us about these <laughs> openings. Uh, what are you looking for? <laughs> this is Who great. are you looking for? This is great. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, I, I, think, I, I think I've watched um, kind of the flow of people starting as homepage editors and then being social editors and being mobile editors or app editors. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is what we need are editors, people who have good news judgment, who can write good, clean, engaging copy and who love the internet and can, or at least curious about the internet and all these different platforms. So, you know, I, I think those are the core values to me. It's like, can you spot a good story? Do you know when to run a story? Can you write well? Um, and do you have that like news value? And also, do you love the internet? Are you curious about how people get and share information? Um, so, you know, I, I was saying that um, in looking to hire, I'm not really looking at like, have you been a social editor before? I just want to know if you've been an editor and are curious about social. Okay, maybe I could apply. Yeah, do you want to? <laughs> this would be great. Okay, but I only have about what, 40 apps on my phone? Actually, I have about 80. Tell them how many apps you have on your phone. Um, I think it's like almost up to like 350, maybe 400. I, I just like, I, I'm an information maximalist. I don't get overwhelmed with more information. I just believe in having good filters, so. <laughs> you must. 
So uh, another thing that you brought up is that some of the things the Times, you know, can do, the Times does, that smaller outlets can, you know, can do the same thing. And you brought up one example. What are some of the other things? So I actually think there's, so I think because I worked at the American Press Institute where, you know, we worked with newsrooms across the country, my, my constant mission is to say, what can we replicate? What can we share? We even did this at BuzzFeed when we were launching the news app. We were constantly writing about our process of launching the news app, what we learned. Um, and I think a lot of the times these lessons are very replicable. Um, and I think it's about understanding like, how things work and then applying it to your specific newsroom or community or audience, right? I think we know what the best practices are. Um, Tom's gonna love this, but I also, like, betternews.org is amazing. It has so many resources about kind of best practices for the newsroom. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of that knowledge is there, and it's, it's, to me, it's really about, like, the day-to-day -day execution and, like, executing really well on those. Um, the two examples I shared were what about taking in signals from search and social and kind of using them and applying your own like uh, organization's news value to them. Um, and then the other one was about kind of reaching niche communities or new, commu or new audiences that you don't already reach. Um, and those are applicable to any news organization. Okay, well that works well. By the way, we will be taking questions if you wanna start um going to the side to ask Millie something. We have a ball. Oh, we have a ball. Or a cube, I'm sorry. We have, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what is a cube? I am um, ice cube? <laughs> ice hodge. Oh my God, this is really terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Actually, reading all this the is like my life. Time, it's like a, I feel like I'm, yeah, living in Twitter so seems terrifying. If, if you were an academic. I wish. Okay. Well, yeah, until. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's this nasty. Maybe I'll apply to your school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so if there were a research, if you had someone who could spend the next two years of his or her life researching something, what would that be? Wow. Um, Someone who would, you know, they'd be using theory, a literature review. Oh my God. I like can't. <laughs> it's like, I feel like I'm in Black Mirror. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> um, so I should say, in undergrad, I wrote my senior thesis on cyber war. That was almost a decade ago, and I feel like I was way ahead of the curve, and I'm sorry to have missed it, because I could be cyber war consultant. But I think right now, my current obsession is truly like how people spread information. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that there's this shift that we're gonna begin to see about uh, from like, public sharing mm -hmm. to more community sharing or smaller groups and smaller walled gardens. Um, if you think about like WhatsApp group or Facebook groups, that's where a lot of the misinformation starts, right? Like you think about the story about measles and mm -hmm. vac like vaccinations. All, a lot of that is happening in smaller closed communities. Um, and, and that's a challenge because it, it's hard, like how do you research that better? So I would oh, no, love. we can figure that out. Yeah, great. I would love to read that. <laughs> so, okay, now you have a dissertation idea. Who wants it? Oh, yes. There you go. Can you do it? Oh, nice. Wow. Uh, I have a question about technology and tools. Uh, so when you are watching the signals on social for news demand, sharing these this information with your your newsroom for new uh, coverage topics and uh, also measuring the feedback loop that you're getting like what are your favorite sites or tools or technology that you're using to watch and measure I actually did a New York Times post about all the tools I'm using oh. <laughs> um, but for social, <laughs> for social it's um it's a lot of you know, we use CrowdTangle, we use NewsWeb um, for 
also Twitter and Facebook, obviously. Um, for search, we're using Google Search a lot. There's, I hate, there's so many tools. Um, obviously, Chartbeat is something we use a lot too. Um, <laughs> Woohoo! Bonnie is here. This is like an ad. Uh, <laughs> we use it, great internal tools too. Um, it, it's kind of. Shall we main secret? <laughs> It's, it, you know, it, getting the information is not the challenging part, right? The challenging part is synthesizing and analyzing and saying, like, this is worth it, this is not, this is what I'm going to, like, send to an editor and say it's worth pursuing or worth covering more deeply. Good. So. One there. By the way, I'd forgotten about, which I'm now going to call it Mike Cube. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. Good assist. That's Thank you, new friend. Um, hi, Millie. Hi. <laughs> um, I want you to expound on your question, your one-to-one -one communication thing, because as a social person, one-to-one -one is the hardest to get into and be authentically in there. Not like, hi, I'm a journalist. I'm going to invade your WhatsApp conversation, and it's totally all on the record now. Um, definitely just keep saying what you're saying. Um, I, I think there's a lot of pitfalls to that. I'm curious to what you think journalists' role is in that versus just the public's in general. So I, I don't pretend to have any answers to this. Um, and, you know, I think it's less one-to-one, -one, but, like, how many group chats are we in? I, I feel like my Facebook notification is just like all Facebook group notifications. Um, it's l much less like me communicating on my wall or something. Um, but I think what you're getting at is journal, like how do reporters come into that? How do editors come into that? And I think that's where you see the value of beat reporting really play a role. Um, the value of really knowing the community you're covering, the value of being able to jump in a conversation and actually like, truly participate in it um, versus, you know, again, just parachuting in and pretending to, it's, it's very clear when, you know, you jump into a conversation just for the news versus coming at it, having done the work, having know the problems deeply. Um, so I think that, and I think the focus on reporters and the things they care about and know deep about um, will will is in parallel with kind of user changing user behavior. That's that's my best guess anyway. Okay, another one. How's it going? Hi. Hello. Yeah. This is great. Hey. Ask me this easy is questions. Delightful. Um, my question is how how are you helping the audience then be prepared to interact with Times journalists? What is the value to them that if they have a closed WhatsApp group? to say, yeah, I'm going to let this reporter in. Like, I, I don't have a relationship with them, but I, I'm going to go out on a limb. And then how is the Times kind of repaying them and help other than just giving them information, but saying, we, we trust you too. We want you to have this relationship. Oh. Um, I think one of the most amazing, we talked about comment sections earlier, and like truly one of more delightful comment sections on the internet is like around our New York Times products, whether it's like cooking or just on our articles. We have an amazing uh, like reader center team that moderates a lot of those. Um, and one of the amazing things is that there's such expertise in those comments and from our readership. Um, and I think we can probably do more in our actively thinking about how we can use that a little bit. Um, so it's not, it's not just a one-way street, right? Um, so I, I, think, I think that's one thing. Um, I'm excited to see how this plays out with our new parenting products because that's such an intimate thing and it's, you know, it's about kind of very personal topics about like how to raise your children. It, it can be about vaccinations. It can be about education. It's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of really personal things. So I'm excited to see how we navigate that too. Hi there. Uh, I wanted to ask about the positions that you've had. You said previously both weren't uh, like established positions. So I was just curious uh, how those like came about, if it was something that like you were pitching yourself um, for a team, um, or basically like what was the genesis of those two opportunities for you? 
And she's a good one, by the way. <laughs> Hi. We should talk after. Um, Seriously, did you hear what she just said? I didn't hear it. Okay, yes, yeah, say it again. We should talk after. <laughs> um, I'm embarrassed to say I also have a slideshow and presentation on this. Um, but, it, you know, I, I very much think about jobs as problems to solve. Um, and I think with those two roles I talked about, whether it was the director of global adaptation role or the global growth editor role at the times, um, they're about specific problems that those news organizations were trying to solve. And I think if you can help, so I, another thing, most job listings are a best guess at someone trying to solve a problem, right? So if you can take that and kind of reverse engineer to say like, what are they trying to do and what is actually the problem they're trying to solve? And how can I, with my skills or experience, fit into that and why I may be the best candidate for that? that that's how. Um, in lieu of a job posting, you can just go straight to the problem and say, like, this is why I'm the best person to solve this problem, which I think you may have. Okay, shout out your email address so she can. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to her. So I think that was our, our last question. Yeah, or, or if you have well, it, I, I have one question. So, you know, Nipsey Hussle was fairly, like, a lot of people knew about him. But do you find that you're making sure that you're looking at the social channels beyond, like, black Twitter, that you're getting real engagement with communities. I guess you could consider Nebraska an underrepresented community in that sense. But, um, but yeah. yeah, how are you making sure that you're not just getting the same types of voices? Um, I think that's where it's really important. I, I don't know if I emphasized this when I was talking about the Nebraska and the flooding, the flood stories, or Nipsey Hussle for that matter. But we, we, have, we send reporters all over the country and the world to talk to people um, we also had this great piece from the Upshot uh, last week about how the Democratic electorate on Twitter is not the Democratic electorate in real life. And I think... In the, in the booth, in the voting booth, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really important to remember the limits of platforms. And, you know, if you go look at uh, Pew's reports about who's, like, the percentage of Americans on certain platforms, you know, that, that's where you have to remember you can't extrapolate and that's where I recommend thinking fast and slow because it's all about our biases. Um, and like you, we're prone to think about the law of small numbers where you know, a minority of loud voices can kind of overtake the conversation. Um, so that's why it's really important to talk to people um, on the ground in real life. Uh, not to say that you know, Twitter isn't real life, it's just a kind of small slice of it. So you kind of, you, you ha again, this is why like getting the signals is the easy part, it's really, synthesizing under, and understanding the value of each because oftentimes it's like if something pops up on black Twitter that doesn't mean it's less important because it is and, and it may not actually represent right right right, right. Uh, you know the right African American population right. so, so you you constantly have to take in these signals and apply news judgment which is why I think that's so important and critical to any of these roles well thank you so much Millie and yes it was great Thank you.